All right, cool. All right, go ahead. We can we can we can move forward. I got five people attending. Go ahead. Go ahead and steer. Um, uh, Ken. All right, cool. So, um, uh, kind of going on to the standard agenda for today, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, Prometheus graduation. Um, have a couple of community presentations, um, and then talk about the backlog a little bit and have some open Q and A. So on the Prometheus uh, plus open metrics graduation, Prometheus has graduated and um, open metrics is being spun out into the sandbox. Awesome. Any um, comments or questions about Prometheus and open metrics? Outside of finally, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> About time. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then um, we received a request from Fluent D. Uh, pull request 69 and 145. And I think, um, I think, Chris, in my opinion, I think we should go ahead and send this out for vote. Yeah. I mean, it was a big open discussion topic. I know Brian had some comments, but. Um ideas to open discussion whether we want to move forward on the vote or potentially hold and uh, review it more and potentially also add a security audit uh, requirement for graduation but Chris I was I was just curious I had a question um, it seems like that review has sort of been open with no uh, specific reservations expressed um, for since February, <clears throat> I was just wondering if there was any context there. Why why has it been held up for so long? Were there concrete objections that were raised that are not in the PR or the only concrete thing on our end was just a, a legal review on the CNCF side, which which we which we we've completed. So now it's just up to the TOC what you want to do with it. So I'm just waiting on an answer from you. Uh, we, we should just. Put a deadline on that and then vote i mean it, we can't leave it sitting around for six months with without making a vote <laughs> well i think there are also um it may have been the first project to apply yeah. for graduation yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we we hadn't graduated any so we didn't really have a Correct. process or um we weren't really confident of, of uh how to apply the criteria and things like that uh, Correct. so we chose to focus on Kubernetes first, and then Prometheus came up after yeah. that. Um, I, I did take a look uh, in more detail at dev stats and um, some other information um, from directly from GitHub and so on, and had a, a thread with um, Eduardo. Uh, Eduardo, yes, thank you. Uh, and I don't really have any reservations. I, there's inf information from that thread that might be useful to post to the PR comments that explains some of the things like a lot of the activity in Fluentd has been in the ecosystem rather than in the core, which is useful. They do have two uh, active contributing companies as uh, maintainers on the core project though. Um, and that seems to have a, a reasonable number of contributors for the size of the project. Fluent Bit, which is the smaller, newer project, doesn't have as much contributor diversity, but sub projects in Kubernetes don't all have equal numbers of contributors either. So I wasn't that concerned about that. They also, Eduardo felt that the number of contributors was in good shape, it was uh, sustainable. So I didn't really have any red flags. Obviously, it's been used in production by quite a large number of people for a long time. Um, so I think it meets. Uh, the other graduation criteria. Yeah, and I, I know I had um, some evaluation of it we did here just to kind of see if it was a solid and it was um, it was solid in a lot of our testing. So I, I have no issue with it either. Yeah, um, so I didn't I didn't see any red flags like PRs pending forever or things like that. In that sense, it seems in much better shape than Kubernetes. <laughs> are, they, are they asking for a security yep. review, an audit review of it? Or are uh, we just wanting to add no. it as like a general requirement? That's an orthogonal requirement. Okay. Yeah, 
I don't know that we need to block on that okay. for fluency. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, if there's no, no, so no in opposed. particular, I think they were seeking to uh, do this relatively quickly to align with an event. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, and given that they've been waiting for us for six months, uh, yeah. <clears throat> seems oh. seems like we should. Do yeah, that. so we have much better like dev stats is it has much more information and things okay. like that. So the from my perspective, uh it looks good to go. Okay. Yeah. If no one opposes, I'm I'm happy to put forward the vote um later today. Yeah, if you want to send out something on the POC list just to make sure there's no major opposition, Chris. But okay. Yeah, let's go. let's let's do that since there's some TOC members not on the call. So I I will do that. Yeah. So good point. Thanks. And then if, if we took it talk about the auditing piece set, but I think um, I'm I'm in favor of adding that as a um, as a requirement for graduation um, going forward, Chris. I don't know, yeah. like I don't want to force it on. Yep. I don't know if we want to make it. I guess I said requirement. I don't know if we want to force it on projects that have already graduated, yeah. right? But yeah. I think it's a good it's a good it's a good capability to have available yeah. for companies to request. So maybe we make it like a a suggested, you know, we like to we'd like to offer you this capability for yeah. you like you said the CNCF pays for it. So it's a nice yeah. benefit for the community. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I think I think if we if we are gonna make it a graduation criteria, I think we do need to strongly encourage the existing projects to go through one. Otherwise it looks we, like we've got some kind of a uh exclusion. Yeah. Right. Especially I, I, given I, yeah. I'm I'm happy to have Kubernetes go through it. Core DNS went through it, which is technically, I guess, part of Kubernetes now. So it, it you know it's up to the community really to make this um, request. We piloted it with a few projects in CNCF, and it's been uh, actually super successful in my opinion. So uh, happy to do it. The only request I made uh, in the PR was just that we be very clear about what we actually want them to do. Okay. Uh, that that we don't leave it loose as to any anything can be done, otherwise it becomes a checkbox item. <clears throat> yep. All right, let, let's have a little bit more discussion on that and then hopefully we could close out that requirement by the next TOC meeting, but it looks like there's generally broad broad support as we, as long as we clarify the details a little bit more on it. Yeah, cool. I think that's sort of like a, a general, there have been some emails um, we've had back and forth the last couple of days too that I've been reading at, um, I think, you know, um, Brian Grant brought up that we just need to sort of, I think, review those requirements yeah. that we have for graduation and sort of make them a little bit more clear. So yeah, it, yeah, we don't have many opportunities. We don't have many opportunities to update that list, but we we might as well take a take a second look at it after we graduated a couple projects. So. <laughs> yeah, and I think the same goes for Sandbox, which it was another right. topic. I don't know if it made it onto the agenda, but yeah. All right, I'll, I'll make that as a, a to-do item. So um, I, I think that's good for now since we have a few um, yep. community presentations we should probably move I forward. Agree. Thanks. Um, the next slide is just the um, some of the uh, upcoming project reviews. So I uh, was still seeking some sponsors from the TOC for Cortex. Mm -hmm. And um, we already have... Um, yeah, TIKV is good to go. So we'll be announcing that next week. And we are uh, we're going to discuss, um, I think, offline the some of the other presentations on here in the backlog presentations, backlog um, items. So, or online. Yeah, yeah I, I just I just sent an email about that. Yeah, I would like to have a discussion about what we're looking for in some of these categories, since uh, similar or projects in similar categories have come up in the past, or we expect to come up more frequently in the future. So just so that we're prepared a little bit with what to ask some of these projects yeah. so we can be a little bit more deliberate about um, which kinds of projects we take in as opposed to just sort of uh, being reactive yeah. to the ones that express interest. Yep, I completely agree. Oh. All right, and so with that, we would move over to the community presentations. I don't know if um, Terrence or Joe, Terrence or Joe are on, or Steve. I'm on. Uh, this is Terrence. Hey, Terrence. Uh, it, 
Steven on? I should be on. Yep, I'm here too. Cool. All right. Uh, yeah, I saw yeah. Steven earlier. Cool. <laughs> Sounds good. Should I just start then? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, we have so, the, um, if you've seen the screen, we have the slides up. Yeah, I can see them. Awesome, thanks. Uh, hi, so yeah, I'm Terrence. I work for Heroku, a salesforce.com company. I'm one of the co-creator of Build Packs. Uh, with me is Joe, who else works at Heroku. He's an architect uh, on my team and then is the Java experience owner at Heroku. Uh, we also have Steven, who is the Pitiful product man is a Pitiful product manager in Cloud Foundry Build Packs project lead. And then we also have Ben, who works at Pivotal and leads the Cloud Foundry Java experience. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Build Packs, uh, Build Packs turn your source code or app artifacts into a running application on the cloud and really want to meet developers where they're at today, which is at, at the source code. Um, and it's been around for over seven years, so it's an old project. Uh, at Heroku, we used it to basically turn our Ruby specific paths into a polyglot specific path. So this enabled us to support other programming languages on the platform. Um, and uh, since then, uh, there's been a number of other players in the space, uh, Cloud Foundry being one of them that have really kind of in endorsed and adopted build packs. Um, and more recently, Knative added support for it as a way to handle source to container building or one of the ways that you can go ahead and do that. Uh, next slide. And we have customers uh, across both startups and enterprises. And the reason startups really love using build packs is that it enables them to get this really quick time to production, have these fast, rapid iterations and push out features and bug fixes. And on the other end of the spectrum with enterprises, uh, it allows them to have this security and compliance story. And the way this is achieved is by separation, separating the application concerns um, from the rest of the infrastructure and operation concerns. And so this allows application developers to focus on actually building their application and kind of the application operating um, people to focus on actually operating and managing um, running that application. Uh, next slide. Uh, and another reason people choose build packs is that uh, there's a community behind it. So between both Cloud Foundry and Heroku, we have 13 people that are paid full time to work on build packs, maintain them, support them, and ensure when you choose these build packs that uh, they're well supported and up to date. Um, but if you can't find something that we support, there's actually an entire community of build packs. Uh, next slide. Um, so here's a list of the build packs that both Cloud Foundry and Heroku officially support. Um, and most of this stuff is centered around languages. Uh, but since we've uh, kind of open sourced it and introduced it into the community, uh, the community has really showed us the versatility of build packs. So beyond just adding new languages, which they've done that we don't necessarily support, uh, they've added support for various tools as well as uh, off the shelf uh, products that you can kind of just install without having to deal with the integration work it takes to get this stuff up and running. And these are examples of uh, build packs that are being implemented. And so if you need to go off and build your own, it's not too complicated. Um, but we're what we're proposing here isn't the actual build packs themselves that we want to contribute, but the API infrastructure that actually power the build packs. Uh, next slide. And so kind of stepping away from the high level and kind of digging more into the build packs themselves, uh, uh, simply when you take your app source code, which is where the developers start with, uh, and then you, you run them through a build pack or set of build packs, at the end of it, you get uh, this tarball, which is a runnable artifact. Um, on a Cloud Foundry, uh, they call it a droplet, and at Heroku, we call it a slug. And what you get with this tarball is this AB, ABI compatibility guarantee with the underlying libraries in the operating system. And so this allows application operators to provide uh, underlying OS image updates without the need to, for the application developers to uh, have to really do anything uh, or rebuild their application at all. Um, and so if you need to patch a CVE, um, the app operators can do that in production 
across all the applications. And this is what Heroku and Cloud Foundry have been doing over the last seven years without incident. Uh, and if you compare this to when doing Docker files, the, the whole image has to be built for every single app across your entire fleet of applications. And so again, this allows app developers to focus on building the application and the app operators to focus on actually operating their application and um, and so allows people to quickly get stuff up and running and maintaining these applications in the cloud. Um, and now I'm going to hand it off to Steven to talk about kind of the shortcomings that we see in build packs today and kind of where we want to take them. Hey, so thanks, Terrence. So I'm going to talk about some of the drawbacks we have with build packs right now. So uh, each platform has a, sort of a custom build pack interface. So Heroku build packs often don't work on CF, and CF build packs often don't work on Heroku. It's possible to get that to work, but it's a lot more effort. Uh, the, the contract between the platform and a build pack is very basic. Uh, so uh, it leads to a lot of uncertainty about how build packs uh, behave. Uh, they people think they feel like black boxes. Advanced devs, you know, they they say, "Oh, this is maybe not enough control for me." Uh, the, the the simple contract can also make authoring and extending build packs, you know, not the easiest thing because they all work very differently. Uh, you know, you, you may you may be working on something very complex or very simple. Uh, it's not um, it's not an easy thing to uh, make a build pack really quickly and get it out there. Uh, the it's, build packs often involve a lot of unnecessary rebuilds and data transfer. So if you have a thousand Java apps, you may end up storing a thousand JVMs on your platform uh, just because of the way the model works. Uh, the uh, you may end up transferring those JVMs back and forth a whole lot. <laughs> uh, there's not very much data deduplication, like I mentioned. Uh, the uh, it's also difficult to provide uh, additional OS packages. Uh, the um, you know everything they're sort of unprivileged, and, and the model works differently to sort of prevent that right now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so. Uh, in uh, January, the build pack leads from Heroku and Pivotal, we sort of got together in New York and found that we had really similar problems uh, and that we had really sort of similar future goals. Uh, and so we sat in a room for two days and, and came out with uh, or sort of out of that, we got this idea of cloud native build packs, uh, which are sort of this idea that build packs should be universal and use container standards and you know run anywhere and take advantage of, sort of more modern uh, and more uniform uh, you know across platforms uh, technologies. Uh, so the idea of cloud native build packs is that uh, they transform source code into images uh, and uh, just OCI images or Docker v2 images uh, that you know behave sort of similar to how they do today, but you know work on those those container standards and are a little more compatible with each other and with different platforms. Uh, so we use a, a, a new technique that's sort of pioneered at Google right now. It's not Conoco, <laughs> uh, but uh, that lets us uh, manipulate images inside of a Docker v2 registry. That's sort of a new feature of the Docker v2 image format uh, where we can just swap out individual images to update them uh, without having to re-upload uh, you know, previous images or, or regenerate images that don't need to change. So this can, lets us really easily take advantage of uh, you know, API compatibility of OS libs or other kinds of compatibility guarantees provided by different languages. Also, it really minimizes build time and data transfer compared to the previous model. Uh, we're targeting Kubernetes for this effort, uh, but this should be compatible with any image-based platform. Uh, it's, we, we really want this to work well with Helm and run on any OCI container runtime. The whole thing runs unprivileged in a, just a series of images. It doesn't require uh, Conoco or IMG or Builda or anything like that. Uh, and uh, there are no nested container hacks or anything like that needed. Next slide, please. Uh, so I have some questions about that. Sure. Uh, so the container image will be the generated artifact as opposed to a, the slug tarball. That's right. Uh, it's a and, and the about. build process itself runs inside of a container. Yeah, that's right. What is the interface to specifying how to build the container? Is it a script or some new declarative format? Uh, by do you mean like what what? Uh, what creates the other container inside of the container, or what? Uh, how is the build process specified? Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll sort of go into the details in a little bit. There's a okay. detection process that selects a, a series of build packs, and those build packs determine how to build the application. Okay, I'll wait for that. Thanks. Cool. Uh, happy to talk more after if you have more questions too. Uh, so, so our goals for this effort are to uh, alleviate enterprise app dependency management pains. Uh, is, is one goal that we, uh, you know, if you're a, a large enterprise, uh, uh, 
uh, patching you know, a critical vulnerability can, for hundreds and hundreds of applications can take a really long time and rely on a lot of green pipelines. <laughs> With this, you can update lots and lots of images simultaneously in ways that are, that are safe. Uh, so if you have an open SSL CVE, critical CVE, you can patch that really quickly compared to you know, hoping that your thousands of apps eventually get updated. Uh, we want to make all app developers' lives easier, not just enterprise. Uh, the, um, we don't think you should have to, you know, a lot of app developers don't want to worry about the patch version of Node or the patch version of the Ruby they're running, and we think we can, you know, make a system that manages that for you. Uh, we want to unify the build pack ecosystems between Pivotal and Heroku and the community so that all build packs run everywhere uh, and, you know, encourage more contribution to build packs uh, and creation of build packs. Uh, we want to sort of narrowly cover application build. We don't want to have a lot of opinions about how you deploy your, you know, images. There are great tools for that, like Helm, uh, you know, and we're, we're not saying that we want to replace Docker files. This is just an alternative to Docker files to meet, you know, certain use cases. Um, next slide, please. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how they work. <laughs> so uh, the, I'll kind of go over this quickly. Uh, the uh, first thing that happens is detection. There are four steps. So the first thing that happens is detection, uh, where uh, a series of candidate groups uh, are, uh, you know, process the app source code. And uh, the first candidate group that uh, says, yes, this works, uh, gets to run. So in this example, uh, this, uh, this is an APM build pack, a node build pack, and a Ruby build pack. So say you have a uh, Rails app that has Node.js on the, the front end and needs New Relic to, you know, do performance monitoring. Um, the, these build packs uh, would, you know, say yes, this application I'm compatible with this application, and if they all agree on that, uh, uh, they the group is selected. They work to come up with a build plan that has the dependencies they're going to provide, and they work together sort of to come up with the list of dependencies and dependency versions that they'll they'll install during the build process. Uh, the next step is analysis. So during this build process, the build packs are going to generate layers. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. And in this analysis step, they're actually retrieving metadata from the previous layers on the registry from, from the image. So that the build packs can decide whether or not they want to replace the layer uh, because it needs an update, or they don't want to replace the layer because it's just fine and there's no need to touch it. And so layers only go in one direction, out towards the edge, not never come back. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so during the build process, uh, the build packs all take individually take the build plan and metadata uh, that you saw in the previous step. They run in order, uh, and they decide whether or not they're going to replace layers. If they want to replace a layer, they just create a directory with the layer with the contents. If they uh, you know don't want to, they just don't create that directory. They can update the metadata about the layers in a, in a series of TOML files that the metadata is stored in. They also have a local cache they can use to speed things up even further. Uh, and the cache can also be used to supply dependencies to other build packs. There's a particular contract for that. I won't go into too much detail about it. Uh, so in the end, you end up with a whole bunch of directories that replace the remote layers that need to be replaced. Uh, and the platform, the uh, sort of part of the API, the API lifecycle replaces those layers remotely in the remote image. This uses the uh, image layer rebasing strategy with uh, Docker v2 image format in order to just replace the layers in the pre from the previous build that need to be replaced, sort of getting absolutely minimal data transfer and deduplication when so you don't have a whole bunch of the same copies of Node.js. Uh, next slide, please. So when uh, a critical CVE hits or, or any kind of CVE hits in a uh, uh, a layer that can safely be swapped out uh, without changing application behavior, like an OpenSSL, for instance, and the operating system layer, uh, we can rebase lots and lots of apps simultaneously against that new, or lots and lots of images simultaneously against that new base layer uh, to update all of your apps very quickly uh, without any rebuilding. And that's a big advantage of this. This is similar to what Cloud Foundry and Heroku do today in their platforms, but uh, it's sort of like you take that model and shift it onto a Docker registry, that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, the next slide, please. So we have a bunch of planned contributions here. A lot of these are already finished or near finished. So we currently have a working document for an API v3 specification for build packs that's uh, stable, but it hasn't been completely formally specified yet. Uh, we have a rep reference implementation of this that's finished already called the build pack lifecycle v3. Uh, that's just a series of images. They don't require privileges, as I mentioned. You can plug them into any platform if you're willing to coordinate them yourself, uh, but we'd like to have some tools to do that for you too. Uh, so we ha we're working on a pack CLI that has just an early alpha out. You can barely do anything with it, but it does work with one sample v3 build pack at this point uh, that coordinates these images. Uh, the, the pack CLI does this locally on a Docker daemon uh, for now. Uh, but we're also going to work on a controller. Uh, this hasn't been started yet, a controller for um, 
uh, build pet cloud builds on Kubernetes. That's, that's the next step. Uh, we want a controller that'll automatically coordinate this for you on your Kubernetes cluster and potentially update uh, images to, or update deployments to, sorry. Uh, we also plan to provide cloud builder images, not just for sample v3 build packs, but for the current v we call the Heroku build packs v2a and the cloud foundry build packs v2b in their specification. Uh, the, we plan to make cloud builder images for them as they are today uh, so that you can start using these quickly without uh, us needing to port them to v3, which will happen you know, over some amount of time. We, we plan to do that soon, but we, want, um, we wanted to make this compatibility layer there so you could use them right now until we, we finish that process. Uh, the, and you can use those today right now too, if you want to. Uh, the Cloud Foundry ones work in Knative. They're already in the, the, that project. Uh, a, uh, we also, Heroku has an open beta of a new curated registry for community created build packs that they wanna to contribute to this effort also. Uh, it's really exciting. <laughs> We'd like one, one central source of build packs uh, that we can- uh, hi, hi, this is Dan Kahn. Uh, just quick question on that that I'm, I'm unclear about. The existing Heroku build packs that are in production today, so like the Ruby or the Node ones that are used by thousands or tens of thousands of folks, are those getting contributed into this project or are, are you suggesting a model on how they can be built but they would still live outside of this project? That, that, uh, it's the latter. So that we're not contributing, currently we're not contributing the Cloud Foundry Heroku build packs. They're sort of large projects that have you know individual communities on their own you know we may we may have build packs in this project later it's just not an initial goal uh, the the things that I'm talking about with the cloud builder images are uh, just uh, we made a compatibility layer to run CF or Heroku build packs in images in an unprivileged way on these platforms that doesn't use, quite use the v3 API yet but will let you use those build packs right now outside of Heroku or outside of cloud boundary uh, so it's it's the compatibility layer that's that's uh, the contribution Does that make sense? great thank you Cool. Uh, next slide, please. So we have uh, two sort of key needs uh, if we were to join the CNCF. Uh, one is we need a, a neutral third party to foster collaboration. Uh, we, we don't want this to be a pivotal thing or a Heroku thing or a Cloud Foundry thing. We want this to be a uh, open project that anybody can contribute to fairly. Uh, you know, we want build packs to run everywhere, not just on particular platforms. Uh, we need adequate vendor neutral infrastructure. Uh, you know, if we're going to host a registry of build packs for CI, CD, all that stuff. Um, we want to be able to ship build packs quickly to people with new dependencies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and finally, the, uh, we think there are a lot of benefits of CNCF inclusion for us and for the CNCF, hopefully. <laughs> uh, we uh, we think a uniform build pack interface specification uh, as part of a CNCF project would allow uh, the CF and Heroku build packs to run any platform, you know, greatly improve cross compatibility and interoperability of build packs, uh, that, and with community build packs also. Uh, this would facilitate the adoption of container standards because there are a lot of users using build packs right now, and uh, build packs don't use all the container standards that you know currently that the the we we'd like to see. And so by uh, you know making those users uh, use this this new build pack specification that uses those standards, will pull more people into this ecosystem. Uh, the association with Kubernetes and other CNCF projects, we also think will encourage wider contribution uh, and hopefully dispel myths that build packs are very platform specific and that you know you have to make your a Heroku app or a Cloud Foundry app, you know, you make a build pack app that you know doesn't doesn't have much, has very opinionated configuration, doesn't have much configuration at all. Uh, and finally, we are looking for TOC sponsors for the CNCF sandbox. Uh, so uh, sponsor us. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that's about it. That's it. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. Stephen. Thanks, um, Chance, for the overview. Um, are there any additional um, questions? So, when an image is uh, has some layers updated, does that affect all pullers of the image at the same tag or digest? Uh, so, the it actually creates a new image SHA. Uh, so you can choose whether or not you want to upload it uh, with a different tag, or you can uh, you want to replace the tag and point the tag at the new SHA. Okay, uh, that means cool. if you use a SHA-based deployment, though, you do have to update your deployment, uh, or if you know, you're using tags, you have to make sure the image gets to the edge somehow, right? So okay. there are different strategies for that, Kubernetes. Okay, thanks. Do we have any um, TOC members interested in sponsoring? Or, uh, I am. Thank you much, Brian. Okay. Yep. Anyone else? I, I think... might be. I'd like for somebody on my team to look into this a bit more. It's it's interesting. I can't tell how much of this is similar to work we've had to do to get, you know, sort of rootless containers working. Uh, 
and how much of it is completely different. So, And we really rely on this kind of uh, composability of the different components comprising an image uh, inside of Google and inside of App Engine. So I think it's potentially really valuable. So um, I'll put, let's put Brian and Camille on and you know you can definitely have people. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll kick off a thread on the mailing list too for okay. more community input. So cool. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll move on to the next presentation then, Jeez, which Jared. is uh, Jared, yeah, and Rook on, uh, on storage. So Awesome. Thanks. In moving to incubation, it looks like, but I'm still reading correctly. Yes, and uh, can, can you hear me well right now? Yep, we yeah, loud and clear. Good. Awesome, thank you. Oh, yeah, so my name is Jared Watts, and I'm a maintainer for the Rook project. So let's go ahead and start with a quick introduction on Rook. Um, it is already a CNCF hosted project, so there may be you know a little bit of knowledge in the community about it already, but we'll do a quick introduction. So Rook can be thought of as a cloud native storage orchestrator. And what I mean by that is that Rook provides a platform and support for uh, a broad set of storage solutions to be integrated into cloud native environments. And the way it accomplishes that uh, is with a lot of automation, basically. So a lot of uh, administrative uh, operator tasks of you know, deployment and configuration and management of a storage solution over time is handled by a set of operators in the, in the Rook project. So we started uh, when we were accepted into the sandbox stage. Rook was uh, exclusively focused on providing this orchestration capability for Ceph. And uh, since then, uh, Rook is now a, can be thought of as a framework uh, for providing those services and support for many different storage providers and solutions. Uh, and so Rook was uh, accepted back in January as the first storage project to be hosted by the CNCF. And our TOC sponsor is Ben H. Uh, so next slide, please. So we're going to be talking uh, mostly today about the growth and the progress of Rook over the last seven months since we were initially accepted into the sandbox stage. Um, so since then, uh, we have, um, we're looking at you know, a lot of the numerical you know, metrics and data growth in the last seven months. So what we see here is um, a lot of these metrics have, um, have doubled or tripled in the last seven months, uh, like the GitHub stars, uh, the contributor, number of contributors to the project, you know, Twitter and Slack uh, members and followers. Uh, but there's also been some 10x growth, uh, which I find very interesting in the number of container downloads in the last seven months, uh, which speaks to you know, the community growing and the popularity of the project, project growing. Another thing to note here in the growth of the project over the last seven months is that we have uh, added another maintainer to the, to the project uh, to bring us up to four maintainers from three organizations now. Uh, next slide, please. So we can talk uh, about some of the specific uh, accomplishments now since Rook was accepted. Uh, so since then, we have done two releases, the 0 0.7 release in February and the 0 0.8 release uh, in July, about a month ago, which represent a total of uh, 545 commits between the two of them. Um, another thing that we have done in the last seven months is we have gone ahead and implemented uh, a formalized governance, a project governance policy. And you know, that covers things like adding and removing maintainers from the project, what the specific responsibilities of the maintainers are, uh, conflict resolution and voting process, you know, all the typical things you would find in a governance pro policy. And then we, after that policy was uh, implemented, we went ahead and followed it to add our fourth maintainer to the project. Um, as we talked about earlier, we, we had originally focused exclusively on Ceph. And now we have uh, a framework for other storage providers as well. So that kind of makes, uh, you can start thinking about Rook now as a general general purpose cloud native storage orchestrator. And you know, some of the, um, you know, the benefits or the um, aspects of that framework are kind of normalizing the way that storage resources for a distributed storage system would be declared. Um, some of these uh, patterns around operators, um, you know, autom software automation to deploy and manage uh, distributed storage systems, the plumbing for those operators to, to talk to the Kubernetes API, 
uh, a bunch of common you know, specs, um, policies, um, logic that can be shared amongst the, the various storage providers, and then also a integrated uh, like integration testing framework and environment that these storage providers can all reuse. So we, with that framework, we have added uh, in the 0 0.8 release uh, support for both CockroachDB and Minio, and uh, NFS, Cassandra, Nixenta, and Alexio are all coming along. Uh, NFS is um, just about to be merged into master, and that was taken on by um, a student this summer for the, their Google, Google Summer of Code project. Uh, so we're happy to have a contributor from that program as well. So, um, so that's, yes. that's great because it, and that was definitely a subject of discussion um, earlier in the year or early last year when we talked about it for the first time. Um, are people actually deploying on other storage backends? I assume that most of your production employments are still on Ceph, but it, are, are you seeing an interest in, in production deployments in some of these other backends? Uh, yes, we have seen um, interest in CockroachDB and Minio and then some of the uh, other um, platforms as well. They're both, uh, you know, very early uh, alpha stage support. So they sure. you know, don't have nearly the maturity that Ceph does or the community built around that Ceph does. So, you know, the, the majority of our downloads are, are definitely Ceph uh, right now, but we are seeing some traction growing from some of the other platforms. And something I find in interesting as well is that a lot of these, um, the support that's for more providers that's coming along, that's all been community driven. Um, you know, we have folks that demand from the community that it's, they're bringing that demand to the Rook project. We're discussing it in, you know, as a group in the community and uh, new contributors are coming to the project to add support for other providers. Um, you know. So is, is there a consensus that that's the right call for the project in terms of, of getting beyond just Ceph or uh, sometimes it can feel like you're generating kind of false genericism and that it, it, you're creating a bunch of pain when actually people are only using one backend or is the consensus more that um, this is a direction that people want to go and it's worth the genericism? I mean, if that, uh, that's a fuzzy question. Along, along those lines, how generic is it? How much of the API and implementation are shared between the different backends? I'm browsing through the code and it looks like there are at least some specific APIs to, for the, each different backend. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would say that uh, the, you know, the generic, um, you know, kind of general uh, abstractions across all these providers is, uh, it, it is still early in its implementation. And that's, we're iterating over that. And that is growing. Uh, there is absolutely platform specific logic that goes into the um, specific deployment and management of uh, the various storage providers. You know, there's, there's plenty of Ceph specific logic that, uh, you know, you would do to, you know, bootstrap and uh, manage over time a Ceph cluster that does not necessarily have applicability to other storage providers. Um, so there, I, I believe that there is a lot of value in this, uh, you know, general generic approach that we're taking here to kind of abstract uh, the commonalities out, uh, but it is, it is growing and um, I hope to see more of that over time. Well, what is shared amongst the different backends right now? Uh, so amongst the different backends, there are a, a lot of uh, ways to kind of specify um, how a deployment should be run and managed, um, you know, how to select and provision, you know, the raw storage resources, um, how to specify placements or, uh, you know, resource consumption, um, or how to set up networking. Um, so a, a lot of it's uh, more deployment time focused, I would say, and less of it is uh, ongoing management time. Are there uh, clear layers in Rook separating the different concerns, like the infrastructure concerns from other management oriented concerns? Uh, I would say that um, there is a there, there is a separation there uh, with the um, you know infrastructure sort of um, bootstrapping or, or initial provisioning of resources, uh, you know, is definitely a different layer than, than that later um, runtime day two operations. Uh, and then that kind of, you know, bleeds into where the other layers or higher layers of provider specific implementations as well, which are the more of the ongoing management tasks. Uh, so there is, there is definitely some, some clear separation of layers between, you know, that stacked that way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, so then 
back to the uh, progress or accomplishments and sandbox entry. Uh, so the Ceph support that we have has been graduated to uh, beta from alpha. And um, you know what that means is for us is that the you know the community has put a fair amount of miles into the Ceph implementation and the reliability of it has increased a lot. So going forward, uh, the API uh, for you know specifying and managing a Ceph cluster uh, will remain stable, and any updates to it will be done in a way that honors backwards compatibility. The um, I guess we, yeah, we can speed up a little bit. Uh, so some of the, uh, another important feature for Ceph cluster specifically is uh, the Ceph operator has the capability of doing horizontal scaling so it can grow and shrink a Ceph cluster with, you know, obviously no data loss, but also minimal impact to the cluster's performance as well. And then we re revamped some of the security model in Rook so that the uh, operators, um, the, sorry, that the pods that run or been deployed and set up by the operators can be run uh, unprivileged. And the separation of permissions to allow administrators that are running, uh, running Rook and running some of these storage providers have more control over the specific permissions and operations that uh, the operators will be performing. And then also being able to incorporate, you know, pod security policies and things in other environments like, uh, like support for OpenShift. Uh, next slide. So let's go ahead and start talking about with the adoption. Uh, that we're seeing for Rook. So this first slide here is about um, there's some of the bigger names that are in the process of evaluating Rook and you know, they have deployments in their environments. A lot of those uh, right now are they're running internal workloads. Um, you know, they're relying on them and you're internally for some of their business needs, but uh, they are not yet uh, running customer facing services um, on their deployments. Uh, one thing we have seen is, you know, storage systems in general uh, can tend to have longer evaluation periods and they're usually put through a bit more rigorous validation um, when they're, they're being evaluated to, to take, take them to production. So we're seeing, we're seeing folks get some, you know, good mileage on them and, you know, really kind of vetting them for a good, a good long period to get their confidence up. Um, something that I'd like to share too is that there is a, an upcoming uh, CNCF survey that was taking it uh, KubeCon uh, that's going to be released I think next week and amongst um, the some of the questions there about adoption of various cloud native storage solutions um, Rook had the highest rates amongst all those projects that were in the selections there and it also independently confirmed for us that there is you know production usage out there uh, I think that was in between uh, 10 and 15 percent of deployments are, are now seeing production usage so let's go ahead into the next slide. And so these are some of the specific uh, use cases that we have of uh, people that we've, you know, as part of our community that we've reached out to or have reached out to us. And we'll go into some of the details of these specific companies' deployments and their use cases. Um, but, you know, these are some of the ones that we, um, some of the more um, uh, users or adopters of Rook that we've had a lot of experience with and we're interesting and interested in what their deployments are. Um, there's you know, a note at the bottom there about there are also additional adopters of Rook, um, especially those that have uh, on-premise deployments that are running their, uh, running their solution on site and uh, that are not ready or willing to share some of those details publicly right now. Um, but you know, we, there are more adopters there. So let's go ahead to the next slide and let's start getting into a couple of the details of some of these specific um, adopters. So SAP Concur is, uh, I believe that's the biggest deployment that we're aware of of Rook right now, both in terms of the node counts and the end users being serviced by it. So this, uh, you know, they're evaluating Rook right now across 300 nodes in their environment, and it's about 10,000 or so users uh, are being serviced by, you know, with Rook providing the underlying storage for about 400 apps in their environment. Um, so this, uh, this kind of speaks to, um, a couple of their experiences here have kind of speaks to the, um, you know, the ease of use and the reliability that people are experiencing with Rook where a lot of these, you know, administrative tasks or operational tasks for storage systems are automated and, you know, kind of more, they're able to take a more hands-off approach uh, with running, you know, a fair amount of scaled out storage. I also like that uh, from Tiz, uh, one of the senior systems engineers over there at SAP Concur, um, that he really, that uh, speaks to the, the healthy community that we've um, kind of built in Rook that, you know, we have a lot of folks who are, um, 
you know, starting to uh, help each other in the community. It's a, gro a healthy growth of a community where people are, you know, solving each other's problems and, you know, really helping each other out. So well, let's go and move ahead uh, a little bit quickly here now because I think I'm running out of time. Well, is, is Concur the only user you're aware of running at the order of hundreds of nodes? Uh, I think, yes, in the hundreds, Brian, I believe that is the, the only user I'm specifically aware of, yes. And there are none in the thousands? Uh, no, I do not believe there are any in the thousands. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so let's get through, quickly through this. So some of the other uh, users here, um, the Pacific Research Platform is uh, it's funded by the National Science Foundation, and it is a, uh, a large platform that's being built for researchers amongst a lot of the University of California schools and um, other universities around the country to collaborate with large data sets and machine learning and simulations, um, you know, image processing, all sorts of stuff there. Um, let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, another um, one of our uh, adopters is the Center of Excellence of Next Generation Networks. It's, a, it's in Canada. It's a consortium of, um, of member organizations like big, big telco and device companies like Bell Canada and Rogers, Cisco, Nokia, um, that are working to create an ecosystem to grow the Canadian IT sector. Um, they, uh, you know, have... Um, uh, like a, a one of um, a, a mix of you know both uh, you know storage focused nodes and compute focused nodes, and you know the ability to select and and uh, you know isolate or use the storage resources while being able to also take advantage of running workloads on the heavy of the compute focused nodes that you know can access the storage from you know the storage heavy nodes kind of a a hybrid mix there of uh, you know hyper converged environment to be able to take advantage of both storage and compute. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so these, uh, the folks at the Hamburg, Germany, uh, University of Applied Sciences uh, also have a, uh, a, one of our larger deployments that services thousands of, uh, of users at the university there to run really large scale simulations that produce lots and lots of data that needs to be persistently stored and managed and accessed over time. Um, you know, the, what I like about these, uh, their experience here is that they're, they've kind of taken that idea of, uh, of storage resources being treated more as cattle instead of pets, where, you know, they're, the administrators are, are focused less on the nodes level and focus more on the cluster as a whole, because a lot of that automation is being taken care of by Rook at the node level. And then last slide. And uh, Genie is another German company uh, that is using uh, object storage from Rook and Ceph as their backing storage for their end user services. Uh, so they have the world's most advanced digital everyday assistants uh, where you know, there's documents, invoices, forms, all sorts of things that uh, more than 10 million um, of you know, user uploads of those type of um, files getting uploaded to their system and stored, uh, stored in this persistent storage here. Um, that's, uh, you know, it's it's the uh, the smarts or intelligence, you know, that the operators provide, um, kind of give uh, you know the ability to manage their data uh, at an easy you know with all that automation in a very easy manner. But they also you know have the ability to dig into some of the finer configuration options to you know in more advanced scenarios uh, as needed too. So that flexibility of what the operators can provide um, is is helping the the genie guys a lot. I think that was the last slide, so we can have uh, time for any, any questions or move along to the next agenda item if we need, since we're I mean, we might be running out of time. But thank you for letting me talk about Rook today. I appreciate it. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Jared. So I don't know, do we have um, anything we asked most of our questions we went through? Are there any other last minute questions you want to bring up before we move on to the last presentation? I'll, <clears throat> I'll, I'll send a note out so we could continue the discussion on the mailing list regarding whether we want to vote or not. Okay, just in the interest of time. Perfect, that's great. All right, do we have JJ on or Dan for, um, for safe? Yeah, uh, I'm here. Hey, JJ. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks for the time. So um, security, uh, security has been a cross-cutting concern across multiple infrastructure. I think we've brought this up before. And uh, we started pulling, pulling together like a whole bunch of people who are aware of uh, security. And then uh, we, <clears throat> we started this working group about a year back, I think, uh, or maybe less. So uh, 
people that came together, they understood that this is a cross-cutting concern. And then we have like various folks from different organizations, uh, uh, big and small, uh, Google to um, Google to like startup. And uh, in addition to all these organizations, I think we've also tried to bring in external perspective uh, from NIST. And NIST has been wrangling with this problem for quite a while now, uh, whether it's their big data team or their security team. So all these have led to us understanding that there is a broader thing here in security to understand and uh, disseminate knowledge. And I mean, obviously, CIGOT is like way far advanced than like many other infrastructure. Uh, that's part of uh, CNCF. So one of the goals here is to enable cross-pollination between uh, what's learned from other infrastructure to the other infrastructures uh, that are going through the same problems. Um, and we, we have been running this for a while. So there's a lot of information on GitHub. Uh, the link is, link is dropped there. And thanks to Ken for uh, signing up for the sponsorship for this. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And then just before we move on to the questions, just so everyone knows in the um, reference architecture um, discussions we're having, we have split out security now as its own um, category, which I know we need to probably review the categories with, uh, with the TOC at some point soon, um, just to kind of get some feedback on them. But um, so security is, is sort of its own like area, thing by having its own area because of all the obvious, you know, implications about security in, in the industry. So um, just with that, to kind of let you guys know what our thought process is on why this is an interesting work to create. With that, I'll open it up to, to all, any questions. Brian Grant, I'm assuming you're familiar with some of the work that Google work groups are doing. Six are doing in this with the uh, this work group, right? Well, I'm actually not super familiar with Safe. I haven't had time to uh, keep track of it. Uh, within Kubernetes, there are a number of efforts, and I'm not. There are there is some overlap of people, so I assume people are talking. But yep. I haven't. Had yeah, they're working. Time they're to working really together. Follow closely. Yeah, we actually just had a, a great conversation with um, uh, Tim from Sigoth about um, and so the opportunity to you know, have a subgroup combined of members from each group who like sort of brainstorm some of the open questions around, you know, the, there's some identity concern, you know, like how do we um, articulate how identity and authentication works? Cause that has to ideally work across, um, you know, broader than the Kubernetes ecosystem. And if we can get this stuff to be interoperable, it would be ideal. Um, so that's, that's really just uh, beginnings of conversation. So far, we've just had people attend the different meetings just to kind of informally cross pollinate. And then we, we just, we want to, to, to formalize this out a little bit so that we could have um, projects where we work on them together. Okay, other than identity and authentication uh, and various flavors of policies, what else is within scope for SAFE? So at least, uh, so one, at least from, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, so, so one thing to, you know, also, uh, you know, reinforces is that the Kubernetes, uh, policy working group, uh, you know, had a proposal to, uh, you know, uh, create a, a working group here at, at the CNCF level as well. Uh, and you know, we've joined forces with, with that group to, you know, form one group. So, you know, policy, uh, in, you know, uh, policy controls are uh, in scope, you know, yeah. through that merger. So, yeah, to to address uh, to address Brian Grant's question a little further, I mean, uh, uh, it's not full, uh, it's not completed, but I think uh, in terms of layering of security problem itself, there is uh, there is identity, there's authentication, there's authorization, there's policy. Uh, which cuts across like authorization to some extent, then access control is a separate part. Auditing, auditing is another uh, piece. 
compliance is a big beast by itself. So there is like various aspects of security and some of it is touched in some parts of infrastructure to depths, but uh, even to the extent of understanding that these are layered problems versus these some are overlapping problems is less clear uh, in many people. And then there's like endless discussions around um, various models and various uh, various overlaps that exist in this, right? So the objective is to like at least have a common understanding and not talk about uh, talk about the same thing in like n number of different contexts and n number of different architecture uh, infrastructures. Yeah, the main thing is that um, there isn't clarity around what it takes to have a secure architecture and what that even means. And we're seeking clarity around that because newcomers to cloud native who have are deep security experts, it's not um, it's not clear to them how they're supposed to secure their system. And there are different, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about RBAC versus ABAC and they're, they're complementary concepts, but really clarifying when and how and why one would um, secure a system in different ways. And, um, and I think that um, we're exploring, we, we're focusing on the big problems first, rather than, it, and there's like these fuzzy edges. You know, we've had conversations, does this include physical security? Probably not. However, if you have to, if in order to move to a cloud native, um, you know, part of your infrastructure, that has to connect with systems that ensure physical security on-prem, well, maybe we have to kind of touch those systems in some ways. So it's really about like, how do you secure, how do you reason about whether your cloud native deployment is secure? And how do your, you know, how do you keep your end users safe in that, right? So that we were explicitly touching on, well, how do applications become secure? How do they do, um, you know, how do they ensure that their end users have the right security controls and the developers have the tools they need. So where, does that make sense yeah. in terms of scope, Brian? Yes, thank you. I was re reading through the um, use case oriented descriptions as you were talking to. Yeah. I just wanna be sensitive of everyone's time. Um, since, since, since this has the TOC sponsor already, I'm going to just move the discussion to the mailing list and get a little bit more feedback before um, seeing if we call for a formal vote to accept this, okay? Other than that, I think we need to <laughs> wrap things up since we're a little two minutes over. So I appreciate uh, everyone uh, taking the time to present today and uh, check the mailing list for, for follow-up. So thanks again, Ken, for, for taking the place, place of Alexis uh, today. Thanks. Yep. Right, no worries. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all. Bye.